Watch it. Yeah. Hey, let's see your ID. Now let us see your ID. For this film to be almost 30 years old at this point, yeah, it's that old. It's crazy and sad to know that it's things that happened in this film that are still happening now. I hadn't watched this film in a very long time, so while watching, there were certain things that really triggered me. This film is full of triggers, so yeah. And I guess that was the whole point of this film, to make you think and realize how we relate to each other how we judge each other, and how we need to unlearn certain things that we've been taught about each other and life in general. This review was highly requested, so you know it had to be done. And while watching this movie, child, I noticed so many things, and you know we're gonna talk about it. So let's get into it. The movie opens up to a pep rally. We get a brief introduction to our characters and we see how they initially interact with each other. This is the start of their semesters at Columbus University. Two of our characters, Kristen and Malik, meet each other in an elevator and Kristen was nervous that Malik was gonna steal her purse. We can see her biases peeping through. We are then shown how these characters decorate their rooms, and while they're doing this, we get a little hint at their interests and backgrounds. Malik decorates this wall with images of beautiful black women in baseball caps while listening to hip hop. For Kristen, her walls are filled with old childhood family photos while listening to soft rock, and Remy decorates this wall with images of white zombie posters and images of the devil and fire while listening to rock music. It's made clear that Malik is immersed in hip hop culture and is driven by images and appearances. Kristen is sheltered in all about family and memories and Remy is attracted to darker images and media. He is also extremely impressionable, which we will see a bit later. We then go to Malik who is strolling up to his coach for track practice and his coach is not seeing it for him or his behavior. You think because you're a superstar rookie freshman that you don't have to work? I got guys on this field to clean your clock in five seconds. Who? And that was pretty much the wrong response cause his coach swiftly tells him to get off of his field. But before he leaves, he sees a cutie that he's interested in and we already know that she will be the love interest in this film. We then go to another character, Monet, who ends up being Kristen's roommate. I really like their pairing in this film and I wish we saw more of Monet, but they meet and they get along. Monet learns that Kristen grew up near Disneyland, which again shows that Kristen has had somewhat of a cookie cutter, sheltered upbringing. Again, we will see this come out as the film progresses. We go to an out of control college party. I mean, these kids are turning over cars, all in the streets, just a mess. Things that Darker Hughes could never get away with. It's here that we meet Kristen's friends. I use that term extremely loosely and I don't even feel like naming them cause they were pretty shitty. But they are discussing getting an apartment together but Kristen is unable to because her dad was laid off and she barely made it to college in the first place. And her friends have their biases too. Well, you know, my roommate's a Mexican, so I bet she got a scholarship. Ugh. We then go to the black students and the party is lit, but way milder than the previous one we just saw. And Miss Regina was hitting that butterfly. We get to meet another character, Fudge, who is our pro-black character. He's spreading knowledge to these students currently. And really, Fudge was very aware and always willing to spread a little knowledge. He was book smart and life smart, a great combination, but he did have his flaws, like not being considerate of his roommates and the fact that they have class early in the morning. And when one of his roommates comes to ask him to get everyone to leave, of course he wasn't trying to hear that shit. So when it's over, dude. Remy is over this, so he goes outside and flags down the campus security to get them to break the party up. And you already know they did this swiftly. 
and Fudge was not trying to hear it. But you don't hear that down the hall. You ain't sweating them because they playing that hillbilly shit, right? Because I dig rock and roll. We go to Kristen who is walking through the campus at night all alone and another student, Taryn, decides to walk with her so she's not walking alone. It's then Taryn disrupts her sheltered bubble by letting her know that the blue lights are to guide people to the security phones so that they can call for help if they're in danger. Kristen lacks situational awareness. Even that is a privilege when you think about it. But as Taryn and Kristen walk and talk through the campus, it's pretty clear that they could either be really good friends or more. Wait for it. So again, we go back to Malik and his roommate, Wayne, who rudely comes in and turns on loud music while Malik is sleeping. His side of the room is looking pretty trifling and Malik decides to confront him about it. I liked Malik and Wayne's pairing in this film as well. We then go to Fudge, who is observing the segregation on the campus and putting his piece up on game. We learn that Fudge is a super senior and has attended the university for six years. Monet makes a joke about it and Fudge, of course, had a quick comeback. I heard you were a super duper senior. <laughs> I don't already learned the game, fresh fish. Old trout. We go to Malik and Kristen again in class with their political science professor. Mr. Phipps starts the class by asking for a volunteer. No one does it first, but then Malik decides to take the opportunity to brown nose. So he starts reading off a list of names of which his name is included. Turns out the list contains names of students who owe a balance to the school that needs to be paid immediately. So Kristen goes up to Mr. Phipps to try and offer her tears and frustration, but Mr. Phipps quickly tells her to save them for the financial aid office. Malik goes up to Mr. Phipps talking about how he showed initiative and if that counts for anything, like Mr. Phipps can take that and pay his tuition with it. And again, Mr. Phipps suggests that he takes his energy straight to the financial aid office. And then Malik says this. I ain't no dumb athlete. That remains to be seen. Message. We then go to Malik and Kristen crying to the financial aid clerks. Turns out Malik has been downgraded to a partial athletic scholarship due to him not doing what he needs to do on the track field. And Kristen barely makes the needed payment with a little advice from this lady. Baby. You just gonna have to get a job. Malik makes his way back to the track field, humbled, since he's got to show and prove to upgrade his scholarship back to full. And as he's practicing, he catches the eye of Deja. That's her name, by the way. We then go back to Fudge and his boy Dredge. Child, Dredge was on 11.5 the whole movie. But this is another scene where Fudge was just plain inconsiderate. He came in the room while Remy was studying and started blasting music all loud. And when Remy confronts him, he has this to say. Hey man, how would you feel if you had this hard ass class to study for and I came in and blasted my music, man? I wouldn't feel shit, cause that wouldn't happen. Why not? I whoop your ass, that's why. Remy, of course, didn't want the smoke and neither did their other roommate. So they both immediately move out. And now Fudge has the dorm all to himself checkmate. Later on, Fudge and Malik are talking and Fudge asks Malik why he chose to go to college. Malik says that he went because basically it was the thing to do. If you want to be successful or to make it, you got to go to college. Fudge then asks Malik if he was in the middle of a field with the American flag above his head and a stadium full of white people and they were to all turn and look at him while playing the national anthem. What would he do? And he says this. What do you do? I stand up. <laughs> you know, I'd probably be so embarrassed to stand up, you know what I'm saying? Fudge then asks him about running track for school and his current scholarship woes. He puts two and two together pretty quickly for Malik because basically if he doesn't do what the school tells him, then he can't go to school, graduate, or elevate. So essentially the school or the man has got him by the balls. Run, nigga, run. We then go to, I realize I'm saying that a lot, but this movie is full of quick scenes that involve so many of the characters. It's hard not to say it, but yeah. We go to a game room of sorts where Scott, Remy, and Malik are playing games, playing pool, and watching sports. Malik wins a game against Remy, and Remy was pretty peeved about it. 
Wayne and Remy's current roommate asks him to play pool, but he doesn't know how to play it and they don't even offer to teach him. And when his roommate says this, I fell out. Hey, who's the genius who matches roommates up, man? They move me in with a psycho dickhead. It's like the Bates Hotel over at my place. Currently, Kristen's friends are toasted and they encourage Kristen to get like them. Kristen hasn't drunk like this before and again, she's sheltered so she doesn't know her limits or how to look after herself if she's gonna participate in these type of activities and her friends could care less about her whereabouts. But of course, this guy decides to take full advantage. So basically, they start to have relations and when Kristen insists that he puts on a condom, Billy ignores her request and basically violates her. She fights her way from up under him and runs out the house. Meanwhile, he gets cheers when his frat brothers see him running down the stairs with his pants at his ankles. And then Remy's weird ass says this. Say, man, did you give it to him? What? Fuck her, right? She like it? From the start, Remy always gave weird, awkward vibes, but I think this scene showed us that there was a much darker side to him. The fact that seeing a girl in distress running away while this guy is running after her, looking how he was looking, excited him. Dude had issues. We then go to Kristen, back in her dorm room crying, and Monet walks in and notices. As she's consoling Kristen, the phone starts ringing and she answers. Turns out it's Mr. Gravester on the other line calling to apologize and check in on her. But when Monet stands up for Kristen and suggests that Kristen would never want to talk to him, old boy decides to say this and put his life at risk. Put her on the phone, you black bitch! What did you say? And Monet knew exactly who to take it to, and his homeboys were ready. Becca! Like I said, 11.5. And not too long after, they pull up at the party and spot him out. He tries to make a run for it, but it was too late. They drag him outside and decide to make it a teachable moment. Here's what I want you to say. I want you to say, I apologize. Beautiful black woman. I'm sorry, I apologize, black <laughs> mother of Get it the universe. Right. These dudes could literally kick your ass right now and have every right to. And you can't even do a simple call and response. And of course, these runner cops show up to break it up. And surprisingly, before things get out of hand, old boy quickly tries to defuse the situation. We're cool now, right? We're cool, right? I can't believe he just said that. And notice after all of this, they didn't break up their party and force everyone to go home. But two things to know here are, one, Fudge spots Remy and laughs at him. He saw right through him from the start. And two, Kristen's so-called friends had the nerve to say this. I don't understand why they always have to start all this trouble. You okay, Billy? Oh, yeah. After all of this, Kristen is no longer that optimistic, sheltered girl. She's gotten a small dose of how cruel the world can be. She then goes to check out Taryn's group, and this starts a series of events, or I guess I could say a situation that will bring her to her truth. We then go to Malik and Fudge. Malik is searching through Fudge's books for his research paper. He asks him if he has anything about Frederick Douglass and Fudge provides him a copy of his autobiography. He then asks Malik what interests him about Frederick, but when Malik tells him he's only reading about him for his research paper, Fudge was not pleased and promptly kicks him out while encouraging him to keep the book. Now that I think about it, Malik was the total opposite of Fudge at this point. He wasn't book or life smart. All he had was track and field at this point. Then we go to Remy, who meets someone that changes the course of his life. He gets approached by Scott, and initially he thinks he's trying to come on to him and pushes him. But Scott swiftly proves their theory to be wrong. Kristoff, don't ever touch me again. I will beat you to the fucking ground, boy. He ends up agreeing to hang out with Scott and his friends, and we'll see how that turns out throughout the rest of the film. We fast forward to Malik and Kristen in class as Mr. Phipps is giving a lecture and introducing them to what their next paper will be about. Mr. Phipps wants the class to formulate their own political ideology and of course, he had to reinforce some things. Remember, no one is going to treat you special just because you are black. And point out others. Or because you are a woman. Or because you are, what are you? Right. 
But anyway, we go to Fudge getting checked for their IDs again. I'm bringing this scene up for a reason. Wait for it. We then go back to Kristen who is having a meltdown in front of Taryn about how people are looking at her differently after her assault, making her feel like she asked for it. Poor baby has literally no support other than Taryn. Then we go to Malik who goes to Mr. Phipps to complain about how he's not giving a brother a break. But Mr. Phipps quickly shuts that down and brings him back to reality. This ain't cool, dog. How you gonna give me a B on content and then I get a C for some situation mistakes, misspellings, grammatical error, etc., etc. And then instead of taking the L and using those points from Mr. Phipps to make his paper better, he then decides to say this. Cello. Mr. Williams. Now, how are you gonna call him a sellout when you got typos and errors throughout your whole paper? Like, was he supposed to ignore it? I really think Malik had it easy in high school, like most students who play sports, where teachers graded them on an extreme curve. He's not used to having to put in that work, and it's showing. So you know Mr. Phipps had him come to his office, and I don't know why, but this was so funny to me. So, Mr. Williams thinks I am an Uncle Tom. What does that have to do with your ability to place a comma in its proper place or put a period at the end of a sentence? Hmm? Another thing I noticed was how Mr. Phipps always had to have either a peppermint or a pipe when talking to his students. They were stressing him and his brain cells out. But Mr. Phipps goes on to tell him that he's treating everyone the same and that laziness will not work in his classroom or in life. He ensures Malik that he's not in his way and the only person he has to prove anything to is himself. We fast forward to Malik being at a track meet and we see Rike <laughs> on the field. I wonder why he didn't have a bigger part in this, but baby Malik must have not been on his Zoom cause he causes his team to lose and old boy was pissed. I got a lot riding on this man. I'm not about to let my stats get blown. You're the only weak link on this team bro. Child. <laughs> After that, he sees him hugged up with a white girl and tries to pass on his frustration to Deja, but she does it that ish right off. Look at his fool with his cave bitch. Hey, don't that make you upset as a black woman? I don't wanna. The conversation quickly shifts to them flirting with each other, both of them acting like they not already checking for each other. It's cute or whatever. And then we go to Remy and his new buddies. They are asking him how it feels to know that their country is no longer theirs. Yeah, this is why we need CRT. But Remy expresses how he feels like he has no one on campus and that he feels like everyone sticks to their own. Scott and his buddies invite him to be one of them out of everybody he could have bonded with. Ciao. And then we go to Deja and Malik. She's chosen to take on the task of coaching him in his studies. Clearly, this dude was not present in any of his English classes. They have a lot of work ahead of them. We then go to Kristen talking to Mr. Phipps. He tells her that her paper is not up to par because she hasn't taken a stance or anything. She's just spewing out facts without any personal opinions. Kristen is just going through life, not a vision, not a formulated opinion in sight, and trying to steal ideas. If you wish to write about objectivity, write about its use in modern politics in your view. That'd make a good paper, I'll write that down. In future, Ms. Connor, please find your own thesis. Mr. Phipps is looking for an original thought in Kristen, but as of yet, there is none to be discovered. And then he had the nerve to ask Malik this. Did you write this paper? Man, I worked my ass off on that paper, man. I rewrote it three times before I turned it in. Shouldn't be one misspelled word in there. Child, Deja must have did her thing on that paper. <laughs> he goes on to tell Mr. Phipps of the different things he's noticed and experienced on campus. He hates how he has to put in so much work and others have it so much easier. And then Mr. Phipps poses a question that is both different and familiar at the same time. He asks Malik that if he was running at a track meet and he suspects that the other team has a better, faster runner, what would he do? What do you do then? Run faster. Yeah, he's starting to get it now. Then we go to this scene where Remy is in a classroom and he appears to be struggling and takes a moment to notice the other students in his class. We have an African student, an Hispanic student, 
and an Asian student who appears to be smarter or at least be more engaged and it's then that Remy decides to officially choose his path. He may not be as smart, but hey, he's white. So I guess he decides to rock with that privilege. Him and his buddies decide to wreak havoc on other students on campus. Taryn walks Kristen home after their no means no rally that they organized and Kristen invites her in. Taryn reading between the lines lets her know that she wants her to be sure of herself and what she wants before they take the next step. Monet ends up overhearing them and picks up on what Taryn was putting down. We then go to Malik and Deja talking instead of practicing on the field. That's why his team losing. He too busy complaining and not putting in the work. But Malik is tired of feeling like a thoroughbred and feeling like people only see him for what he could do for them and not for who he could be. Deja tells him what everyone else has told him so far, that he's coming to the battle with the wrong weapon. And this serious talk turns into a montage time. We see him and Deja getting closer and knocking some boots to one of my favorite bops. Kissing you is not enough for me. You know I'm a big boy and big boys have desires. I love this song so much, but the live version on Raphael Sadiq's Live at the House of Blues album is just chef's kiss. We then go back to Kristen. She's going on a date with Wayne, and I guess she's trying to work through her feelings for Taryn. We go back to Remy and his crew, and baby, they got a whole bag full of guns. And then Remy's simple ass pulls a gun out and aims it at Scott. Ciao. We go back to Taryn and Kristen, and they are walking through the campus, holding hands. They run into Monet, and she was shook. And then we get a montage of sorts where we see Kristen knocking boots with Taryn and Wayne. Not at the same time though. I think Kristen was working through her attraction for both of them. She's slowly figuring herself out. But then we go back to Malik and Deja and they are, yet again, having a discussion about how unfair the world is. And then Remy decides to show up and show a little courage. You support the Black Panthers? Yeah, and? It's reverse racism, man. 1995, Coon. What? Really, Malik was the last of his worries. Why he decided to go after him and not fudge, I don't know. Yeah, I know why he didn't go that far. But I'm just saying, why him? And Malik being Malik had to fall right into Remy's trap by confronting him at his dorm. And Remy doesn't have the courage as of yet, and Malik knows it. And the fact that Malik was able to see the bitch in him sets Remy completely off. This dude wrecks his own dorm room, mostly destroying his roommate's side and not his. And then when his roommate comes in to see his room trashed, he had the nerve to act like the shit didn't happen. What the hell? And then when his roommate confronts him, he decides to set it off one more again. Meanwhile, Malik overhears all of this and comes in to take up for the roommate. He ends up pulling Remy off of Malik, didn't even steal a lick like he should have done, and this enrages Remy enough to pull a gun out on both of them. And after all this, his scary ass packs a bag and leaves out of the dorm, and not knowing that he's pissed Malik off enough to run after him. And of course, the college ID police blocks him from catching him, and Remy's roommate thankfully comes down to tell them that they have the wrong guy. Child. The police find this in Remy's dorm and then goes over to the black kids and tells them to break it up, totally dismissing the even bigger crowd of white students right across from them. And Fudge was not trying to hear that shit. So the next day, Wayne runs up to Malik to ask him what's going on and Malik tells him that he's moved out of their dorm and really just wants to be around his own people. Wayne tries to ensure him that he's not like Remy or people like them, but Malik doesn't want to hear it. I'm not like that, Malik. I'm different. So are you. I'm not. Neither are you. We then go to Malik and Fudge sitting on some steps when they are approached by Mr. Phipps. What are you two doing sitting there? Plotting? Plotting still. Still the information. All of it. And of course, Malik chimes in and out comes the peppermints and the pipe. <laughs> Malik stays dressing this man out. He again tells Malik that he needs to focus on being mentally competitive. Mr. Phipps tells Malik that life, like basketball, football, or even track, is just the game and he needs to learn how to play it to his best ability. 
Malik then learns that Fudge has taken Mr. Phipps twice. Fudge has learned the game while Malik is starting to get there. The recent events on the campus motivates Kristen to try to put together a peaceful rally to promote togetherness on campus. It's a long shot, but at least she's starting to think for herself. But baby, this is where it gets interesting, and what happens next sets off a chain of events. Fudge sees Remy's buddies in the courtyard and immediately finds his friends so that they can square up with him. But before they get there, we learn that Remy has dropped out of school and somehow he's still allowed to be on campus after pulling a gun out on two students. Child, where is the ID police when you need them? He admits to Scott that he only came to Columbus to get out of Idaho. Scott tells him that dropping out was a mistake and that the world needs more doctors and lawyers like them. But when Fudge and his friends get there, it's on and popping. And again, 11.5. Yeah! And this whole scene was given black exploitation film, especially with the background music. But basically, they kick Remy's and his friends' ass, but not without some war wounds of their own. And Deja was concerned and pissed. I don't need no ice, man. Put the ice on it, Malik. And let's talk about this cringe ass scene. Malik, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Listen, how, how did that even make the cut? So we go back to Remy and his friends and they're talking about how they coulda, woulda, shoulda and Remy is talking mad shit. And while Malik and his boys are celebrating their win, Fudge decides to put things back into perspective. When they ask whoop it, man, they still want One beat down and never compared to 439 years of captivity. Meanwhile, Remy is still talking that shit and Scott decides to make him put his money where his mouth is and dares him to bust a move for the cause. He basically dares him to shoot a black person to prove himself and start a race war. And ironically, Scott pulls Remy aside and explains to him, in a different way, the same thing that Mr. Phipps and Fudge was trying to tell Malik. Basically, there are many ways to fight in this world. There are many ways to fight a battle, Remy. Different fronts for different people. Some people use their mind, some people use words, some people use their fists. This is my friend. So we fast forward to the peace fest that Kristen has put together. Everything is going so well so far. It's still segregated though, of course. Malik and Deja are walking around as Remy is making his way up to the top of a campus building. Again, how is this dude able to roam around this campus freely? ID police, <laughs> where you at? I know the answer, but damn, really? <laughs> Also, during this, Mr. Phipps is reading Malik's paper and again, pulling out his pipe. Although Malik is slowly getting there, he's still working that man's nerves. But Remy's finally made his way to the top of the building as his boys find themselves new victims. As Kristen comes up to greet the crowd and sees both of her potential boos, Remy's preparing for his task as his boys are setting up a distraction. And as a plane flies over, Remy takes his first shot. And Malik knows that sound, and as he glances up, he sees Remy with his shotgun. Malik and Deja start to run, but soon after, Deja gets shot and Malik slowly starts to lose it. He's able to pull her under a statue, and Mr. Phipps comes over to assist, but Malik goes into shock, as anyone would. The love of his life was just shot in front of him. And it's then that he sees Red. So he chases after Remy, and I don't know how long in real time this whole sequence was, but Remy stayed up there entirely too long if Malik was able to go up 50, 11 flights of stairs and catch up to him. And he knocks his ass straight out and they begin to tussle. And when he's finally able to get up, he says this bullshit. It's my world. You're nothing but a monkey. Look at me. Look at me. I'm a man. I'm a man. You're nothing. He talked a lot of shit for somebody that had no hands. But what really pissed me off is that the ID police came to break them up pushed Remy off of Malik and asked Remy if he was okay after Remy was the one to shoot Malik's girlfriend and others and in turn proceed to beat up Malik. And then, if that wasn't bad enough, they beg and plead for him to surrender, talking to him like he's some innocent child. What are you doing? No, 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 don't shoot, don't shoot. Sorry. It's okay, we know, we know. This shit was infuriating. <laughs> I'll save my thoughts for the end. Soundstripe. 
But Malik finally comes out of the building to see and really take in the fact that Deja is gone and Mr. Phipps is there to hold him and console him the best way he could. Omar put his foot in this scene. You can see his rage, sadness, regret, and him finally surrendering to his grief all in his body language. This scene is still heartbreaking. And then we go to Remy's boys who are watching the news and they say this. Why? You know what that is? Remy's fucking dead, man. That's white power. White fucking power! Turns out Remy was a pawn in their plans all along. Scott used his ass to do something that he couldn't do. We go to Malik and Mr. Phipps talking. Malik is trying to figure out his next move. After the semester he's had, he's thinking about taking some time off from school and getting his mind right. He really needs to. They need to offer him a full ride without being on the track team after everything he's been through. It was negligence at best when it came to Remy. But Mr. Phipps leaves Malik with one last word. Without struggle, there is no progress. Frederick Douglass. No pipe of peppermints this time. Malik officially gets it. We then go to another ironic scene where Kristen is sitting in front of the statue where Deja lost her life and Malik walks up. Kristen takes this time to self-loathe, telling him how she feels it's all her fault and she feels responsible. And he walks over to comfort her and tells her not to blame herself. It's so crazy how the one person that she thought would steal her damn purse ended up being the first person to comfort her. It's funny, we never spoke before. Yeah. It's funny. We then go to this funny scene. All right, give us a big smile now. Fudge finally made it out, and that's pretty much the end of the movie. And here are my final thoughts. So, since there are so many characters in this film, I'll discuss them one by one. Let's start with Kristen. As I said before, Kristen was a sheltered white girl from the suburbs. She came to college with her own thoughts about life and people. When meeting Malik, she didn't think to speak to him. Her first thought was to protect her belongings. This kind of hinted at the fact that either she didn't grow up around a lot of black people, or she's been told a few things about black people, or both, to have that kind of response. Meanwhile, Malik was used to that type of reaction. Even her walking on campus alone at night, not knowing about the blue light system, having to be told to look out for herself, she didn't know how cruel the world could be. In a sense, she was ill-prepared. She didn't even know or want to think for herself. It was unfortunate that it took for her to be assaulted, for her to see outside her sheltered bubble, and to get to know herself and try to experience the world and the people in it in a whole new way. It was also unfortunate that the first time she really saw Malik as a person was after the school shooting. He remembered her, but she didn't recognize him. She just saw him as a threat initially and not a person. On to Remy. Remy was a kid who came from a troubled background. His dad was an abusive survivalist who most likely kept him sheltered, which affected his ability to relate and have normal conversations with people in general. Remy had a dark side to him and was attracted to dark images, dark music, and just dark things. Him being unable to connect with anyone led him to be recruited by Scott because Remy, above everything else, just wanted to belong, and Scott and his boys gave him that. Remy wasn't about that life. It was hard for him to take up for himself. People would always try to punk him, which probably triggered him given his experiences with his dad. This led to him wanting to prove himself with Scott and his friends. Also, Remy struggled in school, but attended Columbus University because he wanted to get out of Idaho and away from his dad. Remy had prior issues that manifested into violent acts due to people he chose to surround himself with, and Scott used his trauma against him. I'll get back to this. On to Malik. I'm adding Fudge and Mr. Phipps in this as well. Malik was a jock who was only in school because it had been taught to him that it was a pathway to success. In his mind, he was going to do what little he had to do to get by. This dude didn't even want to show up for track practice knowing he was there on an athletic scholarship. He got mad at Mr. Phipps for not accepting his bare minimum while also trying to prove that he wasn't just a dumb athlete. Malik had a lot to learn about life and also how to handle discrimination. He came at every situation with one weapon, anger. You have to be well equipped for every type of battle, every type of struggle. Anger won't work every time. 
having a defeated mentality only creates more anger and frustration and eventually causes you to give up and give in. And honestly, that's what some are banking on. And I believe that's what Mr. Phipps and Fudge was trying to show him. It's all a mental game and you have to know how to move and play based on what's given and you can only gain the tools needed through experience and knowledge. And what was ironic about this is that Scott told Remy the same thing but in different words. He tried to encourage Remy to stay in school and how the world needs more men like him to be doctors and lawyers. Remy was so angry and only knew how to respond from that place. And in the end, Scott used his anger against him by making him a pawn, while Malik decided to use his anger and grief as motivation to do better, learn the game in order to use it to his advantage, and drop the toxic mindset he once carried. This movie is so layered and deep and so triggering, but it's still just as relevant in 2023 as it was in 1995, which is unfortunate. But anyway, y'all, that's it. Thanks for watching this movie review. Please like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. This review will also be available to watch on Spotify, and the audio version will also be available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. See you next time, you guys. Bye.